I want to thank Avi and the other um, organizers for the very kind invitation to participate in this workshop. I enjoyed yesterday um, tremendously, and I'm looking forward to our discussions today. So I'm going to give a talk on some historical research I've been doing. Uh, it's still in early stages, so I actually look forward to, to benefiting from your uh, comments and feedback. And I've been curious about how we get to a world where we can be suffused with some of these beautiful talks like we heard yesterday, which, many of which rely so centrally on numerical relativity. Where, that, where did that set of techniques and tools come from? So I think many of us uh, might have in mind something like this uh, cartoon drawn by uh, George Gamow, who of course not only helped invent the Big Bang model of the universe, but also was an award-winning uh, popular author, and he'd always do his own cartoons. So this is what he called the Temple of Relativity. Uh, of course, it bears more than passing resemblance to the Taj Mahal. It was literally to be a temple. Uh, we see, of course, we recognize the field equations in this beautiful dome, the geodesic equation above the archway. And to Gamow, this was an, a, a pictorial capturing something special about general relativity that Gamow wanted to emphasize, that relativity was somehow apart from the kind of toils of the world. This was a beautiful structure off on its own, abstruse and otherworldly. And Gamow wasn't the only one. We see quotations like this one from the great mathematical physicist John Singh, in the introduction to his textbook on general relativity from 1960, where he says, of all physicists, the general relativist uh, has the least social commitment. Let the relativist rejoice in the ivory tower, or indeed the temple, where he has peace to seek understanding of Einstein's theory, as long as the busy world is satisfied to do its jobs without him. And I think that really captures, much like Gamow's cartoon, an image that many of us might have in mind about so, uh, how, we, how we as a community have come to learn about Einstein's theory and the basic notions of warping spacetime. However, I don't think it's a very helpful starting point to dig in and figure out how really have we learned about some of these esoteric things. Uh, this, this emphasis on removing the research from some of the messy details of, of human um, politics and society, I think obscures at least as much as it clarifies. So I'm going to give a, a quick example of, of one way to try to understand some key developments in relativistic physics uh, as being thoroughly enmeshed, as being deeply embedded in a messy human world. And I'm going to uh, use Bryce DeWitt and some of his students as my sort of through line for this particular uh, presentation. So DeWitt, I'm sure, is um, an a, a name, and indeed a person well known to, um, to all of us in this room. Uh, DeWitt completed his PhD right here at Harvard under Julian Schwinger's direction. He graduated in 1949. Uh, DeWitt had set for himself the task of quantizing gravity, uh, which, for which he had maybe, let's say, limited success, but they gave him a degree anyway. Uh, it was way ahead of his time. Uh, he then followed uh, from Harvard on a very familiar path. He spent a, few, um, a short visit at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, which was just then becoming a very common next step for uh, ambitious young American theoretical physicists. So uh, DeWitt joined the Institute as a postdoc very soon after Robert Oppenheimer had taken over as director of the Institute. One of the first things that Oppenheimer did, having just led uh, wartime Los Alamos, was Oppenheimer uh, immediately increased by 60% the number of postdoctoral positions specifically in theoretical physics. It was part of an, ex uh, an intentional effort to increase the domestic training grounds for theoretical physics, and DeWitt was one of, of many, many uh, young theorists who went there. But then his career took a different turn, quite literally. DeWitt used a fellowship to then travel to the brand new Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in India, uh, and then uh, got sick there, was there for, uh, on and off for, for um, about two years, and then was trying to come back to the United States and get an academic position uh, as a physicist, and there he kept finding himself stymied. So here's a letter he wrote to the department head at Berkeley's department, Raymond Burge, explaining the difficulties that DeWitt was having. Part of it, as he later came to, to account for it, was that he took himself out of this kind of US-based network. He was very far away, not seeing everyone at the American Physical Society meetings and so on. But he also thought, and was given feedback, that his choice of topic was not helping him either. So as he wrote to, to the department head, owing to the difficult and tedious nature of research in gravitational theory, and also owing to the apparent complete lack of any immediate practical application of its results, I was until recently strongly resolved to discontinue further work along these lines and turn my attention elsewhere. The young nuclear physicists, the young solid state physicists were getting snatched up for positions left and right, but there was uh, not yet much demand for gravitational experts, uh, where GR was still often seen as somehow marginal, to some people it was even fringe. Uh, DeWitt credited Freeman Dyson, in fact, for convincing him not to leave gravitational physics. Uh, nonetheless, he had no particular success along the directions he was looking for on the job market. The one offer he was able to accept was at the brand new Livermore Laboratory, which had just been set up in Northern California at the urging of Edward Teller. 
So DeWitt was among the earliest recruits to Livermore. The lab itself opened its doors in September of 1952. That's around when DeWitt arrived. He did not yet have clearance uh, to work on classified materials, so he was sent to what they then called the leper colony. Uh, and he was basically told to read certain things but don't ask questions yet. He was told to read the Courant and Friedrich's book on uh, supersonic flow and shock waves. This had been published in the late 1940s, bringing together a lot of work that had been worked out during the wartime uh, numerical work. Uh, and then he was also told to read Chandra Shaker's more recent book, published in 1950, Radiative transfer. Now, we all in this room can guess why he was given those books to read, and of course, DeWitt was pretty smart. He was very smart. He had guesses too, but he wasn't yet cleared to talk about these things openly. Uh, he finally got his clearance, and as he recalled, Edward Teller sat him down in his office and told him everything he needed to know, what was known then about hydrogen weapons, building on the still only year and a half old idea at that point, uh, the so called Teller Ulam idea. And again, in brief, as I'm sure many of you know, the key insight here, which had been worked out in the spring of 51, was not to rely only on the heat from an atomic explosion, from a fission bomb, to try to catalyze fusion reactions. Not just the heat, but in fact the uh, extreme radiation pressure. If you could somehow channel these x-rays and get the pressure to help induce fusion reactions among fusion fuel like um, uh, tritium or deuterium, that might actually be a successful route towards um, a detonation. And so then the task became, could you simulate that? That's actually really complicated dynamics, uh, lots of interacting fluids and lots of, uh, in, in an extreme environment. So here's the UNIVAC, here's the electronic programmable computer being delivered to Livermore in that spring. This is what the I iPhones used to look like. So I see this as a kind of continuation to a story that Peter Gallison has written about so beautifully in his book, Image and Logic. For those who don't know, Image and Logic is itself 900 pages. It is itself a legitimate source of gravity, so be careful when you shake it around LIGO. Uh, so Peter's written beautifully about some of the wartime efforts to develop what we now call numerical simulations, Monte Carlo methods and so on. And here's in some sense part of a next chapter. So DeWitt's task was to develop a workable numerical simulation uh, sufficient for these new challenges in the hydrogen bomb project. And for there, they could no longer rely on spherical symmetry. They could no longer do an, only a radial calculation precisely because they had to worry about this kind of collimated radiation. They needed at least cylindrical symmetry uh, and not purely spherical symmetry. They had to do two plus one simulations, two dimensions of space. Now, folks at the lab, even before the UNIVAC had been delivered, were trying to do what, what many people might do. They would fix so-called Eulerian coordinates, fix the grid, and then try to map as various fluid elements would flow through it. And of course, that led to all kinds of difficulties. They got nowhere with this. At any given time step, the boundaries between materials that had, say, different burn rates, the boundaries become very irregular. They would flow irregularly uh, over with each time step. And perhaps most important, the, the elements of most physical interest for these devices things like the flow of radiation and the shock waves, those moved so quickly that they would flow outside the grid before anything you know, physical could be determined. So these efforts had really ground to a halt very, very quickly. So DeWitt, who of course was no stranger to um, choosing convenient coordinates as a relativist, he sat down and said, why don't we switch to Lagrangian coordinates, something more like co-moving coordinates. What if we staple our coordinates to fluid elements and watch them flow rather than fix the grid first? So then you could incorporate all these irregular surfaces uh, at any given moment and so on. One could obviously map the Lagrangian coordinates with respect to the original fixed grid, or one could simply perform the coordinate transformation. So in this new set of Lagrangian coordinates, the elements of interest now looked remarkably more straightforward, more computable. So one again got back to a rectilinear grid at every moment, the flow uh, between time steps was more straightforward. So this is how DeWitt recalled these efforts uh, 30 years later at a celebration for his Livermore colleague, Jim Wilson. DeWitt frequently credited Wilson for having taught DeWitt much of this stuff and got him up to speed with numerical work. So as DeWitt said, one evening, breaking the rules of the lab, and I should say, as far as I know, breaking the laws of the United States, this was, I think, expressly forbidden by the Atomic Energy Act, I decided to work on the problem at home, actually writing things down on paper outside the lab. I took the hydrodynamic equations in two dimensions and differenced them, which sounds straightforward enough. Indeed, he did. This is why you shouldn't do this at home, because these papers are now not classified. They're in his personal archives at Texas. You can I don't know if you can see it. It says detonation hydrodynamics. And here he's working out, presumably at his kitchen table, the different coordinate systems, uh, the Lagrangian and Eulerian coordinates. He also inserts things like the artificial viscosity that folks had worked out kind of as a rule of thumb during uh, wartime simulations. And here is his own, into its own hand, 
these kind of fluid elements of interest at a given time step as, as graphed in the original fixed grid, the, Euler, the Eulerian coordinates, and then here's what it looks like once you make the transformation. Everything snaps into place with these beautiful rectilinear coordinates. He then wrote this up in a formal internal report, a numerical method for two-dimensional Lagrangian hydrodynamics. Teller immediately made, uh, assumed DeWitt was sort of the lab expert on these things and was asked to give many, many internal talks at the lab. Uh, and in the, in the report, DeWitt spelled out why these things were, uh, were so valuable. He says the advantages of a Lagrangian scheme over an Eulerian one are obvious. They were obvious to him, if not to his colleagues. Boundary conditions are much more easily applied. Moving interfaces as well as boundaries are automatically taken care of. And computations are always confined to the physical region of interest, even for sort of fast dynamical processes. He went on, this is again just taken from that after dinner speech uh, many years later, uh, it was one thing to write down the finite difference equations in a convenient coordinate system. He then had to actually make this computer do some work, and that was really, really unusual at the time. I was told, he said, that I had to have a program coded and run before a certain date in June 1954 because there was an upcoming nuclear test. They wanted to have some numbers beforehand. He says, well, it's one thing to have these simple-looking equations and another to apply them. I had to sit down and think about things that had never occurred to me before. And he was assigned a programmer, the actual person who would interface with the UNIVAC, the way it never touched the UNIVAC, because there was a kind of division of labor in just trying to get the machine to respond to these new equations. So he worked very closely one-on-one -on -one with, with his programmer for weeks and weeks and weeks under what seemed like very intense conditions. Uh, so it took years and years of Freedom of Information Act requests to get released these classified pages of DeWitt's own notes when he was working with his programmer. I still don't know. This is called Difference Equations for Tony. I don't know whether Tony was the name of the programmer or the name of some test shot, some code name for the, de for the device. I actually don't know. This consists of 43 handwritten pages that were highly classified and took forever to get released, and they look like this. This is now the form of the Lagrangian mesh, again, emphasizing that everything looks perfectly rectilinear in the appropriate coordinates. And then you see DeWitt really having to be very explicit about things that he'd never had to think about before. How does one specify, for example, initial data? What form should that be entered in? What does one do time step to time step? What specific things do you ask the computer to compute? And this part I found really interesting. When do you pause and read out? How do you know this thing's working? So again, this was trial and error working with the programmer. Stop the program and print out physically interesting quantities at some points, then proceed with the calculation. So he's learning things that were not at all self-evident because so few people at this point had access to electronic programmable computers. So uh, about a year and a half after that, DeWitt did uh, move to an academic position. As many of you know, he and his wife, Cecile Moret DeWitt, uh, became uh, members of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. They actually joined a privately funded institute. It was among the first dedicated institutes in the U.S. devoted specifically to gravitational physics, but there was still such a stigma about focusing on GR. They called it the Institute of Field Physics Incorporated. It was literally incorporated based on a very generous private donor. This is kind of like an early Kavli Institute if the Kavli family had been obsessed with UFOs and anti-gravity, which, as far as I know, the Kavlis actually are not. The, the donor here for, for DeWitt's Institute had all kinds of interests in gravitation beyond merely conquering general relativity. I'll be glad to say more about that later. So anyway, now DeWitt had a private patron to whom he had to send reports every year on how he was spending the money. Here's one of the earliest progress reports from 1956. I'm sorry it's hard to read, but you can see his plans for the coming year were to take exactly what he had worked out behind the fence at Livermore and use these now to simulate strong gravitational systems, including trying to calculate gravitational radiation hydrodynamic representation of the gravitational field equations and machine computations of gravitational interactions, including the correct um, Lagrangian coordinate system and so on. That was his plan. It did not come to pass, partly because they had insufficient computing uh, facilities there. Then the year after that, one of the first things they did do with this new institute, was mentioned in uh, Deirdre Shoemaker's talk yesterday, was because they hosted this famous conference on the role of gravitation in physics that was held in January 57. And a different section of the conference proceedings, different than what Deirdre quoted from yesterday, we read that Bryce DeWitt pointed out some difficulties encountered in high-speed computational techniques. And he's quoted as saying, any nonlinear hydrodynamic calculations are always done in so-called Lagrangian coordinates always done for those who had ever had practice with that, which is a minority of people in the room, so that the mesh points move with the material instead of being fixed in space. When applying to gravitational radiation, you don't want the radiation to move quickly out of the range of a computer. He's mapping point for point the things he'd worked on under deep uh, secrecy into his program, literally his pro programmatic approach, to try to uh, build something like numerical relativity. Now, let me just pause for a moment. There's an interesting kind of um, alternate path 
that comes out in 1964. This, as far as I know, is one of the earliest publications on numerical relativity by a different group. This is Susan Hahn, who is at IBM, working with Richard Lindquist. Lindquist was himself a relativist. He'd worked closely with John Wheeler. So here you have two of those three critical ingredients. You have expertise with computers and access to high-end computers at that point, and you have a, a well-schooled relativist. And yet, they did not do any of these kind of coordinate uh, tricks that DeWitt had worked out for very different reasons. They adopted the so-called Gaussian normal coordinates. They had, in other words, a vanishing uh, shift vector, no kind of relative fluid flow. And this thing ground to a halt in, in a few dozen time steps. This thing could not get anywhere near the actual um, interactions of those two bodies. This kind of stalled out. So a few years later, DeWitt returned to this challenge to try to build, again, overtly on his Livermore experience, began working with a series of grad students, first still at North Carolina, and with uh, an accelerated pace once he and Cecile moved to the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, one of the extra in, uh, in, you know, speed increasers at Austin was that Austin had just purchased what that was then a rather impressive supercomputer, a controlled data corporation 6600. Uh, looks like this, this hulking thing with this very awkward console. At that point, this thing had, could clock in three megaflops, three million floating point operations per second. That's between 10 and 100 million times slower than the kind of machines that run these LIGO type waveform templates. Uh, and so you can trace through these dissertations that his students are adopting very similar um, uh, coordinate procedures as what DeWitt had already done, in this case, 20 years earlier. There's a page from Larry Smarr's dissertation. They're now all explicitly adopting this kind of uh, fluid flow, this, this non-zero shift vector, showing that when you perform the coordinate transformation, you get a perfectly rectilinear grid again, much easier to compute. And they begin building a program, not just literally a program for the computer, but also um, a program uh, pedagogically. So SMAR in particular starts organizing, he then became a postdoc here at the CFA, organizing uh, workshops and summer schools and conference meetings. SMAR was also still working very closely back at Livermore every summer where they had still far superior um, computing facilities. This is, I, I just want to say briefly, uh, SMAR and Bill Press wrote a popular article on this in American Scientist. They were um, working on these new coordinates, describing, as with ants crawling on rubber sheets, what this non-zero shift vector is like. This is one of their first computations of the gravitational waves from the collision of two black holes. And I want to just give you this. On sufficient advance notice, a large quantity of beer, food, scissors, scotch tape, and graduate students, presumably in order of importance, <laughs> are assembled. The graduate students cut the squares out and tape them into strips so the students can practice these very strange embedding diagrams, these non-intuitive coordinate systems. Other students then weave the strips together, basket fashion, into a final embedding diagram. Incidentally, the DeWitt technique, this is what DeWitt students would do, for constructing embedding diagrams lends some credence to the complaint that grad school these days is only so much advanced basket weaving. So a very quick coda, and then I'll pause. Smarr, who was, uh, whom I just mentioned, then went on to basically propose in an unsolicited NSF proposal that the, the NSF should sponsor a nationwide um, uh, uh, system of uh, supercomputers for university-based research, because all the computers then were basically wound up in weapons work. The, the story there from there to where we get to, say, Pretorius and LIGO, I don't know. Hopefully people in this room know. My colleagues, Dennis Lemkul, who's at the Einstein Papers, and Dan Kennefick, University of Arkansas, are, are very deep into this history, doing tons of work, and I look forward to learning more from them. So I just want to end here by saying when we move away from this ivory tower cartoon and ask about access, resources, and infrastructure, we can begin to understand a history of relativity that's more embedded in the real world. Thank you very much. So one of the problems with Lagrangian hydrodynamics yeah. is if you've got any chaotic dynamics like turbulence, these points go all over the place. It becomes yes. complicated. Right. So David must have recognized this problem. Did he have any comments? It's a thank you. It's a great question. My, here's my early understanding. I didn't emphasize it much here. He also was putting in so-called artificial viscosity, which I assume would help damp these things out. And he, he credits that from having learned that from people like um, Jim Wilson at the lab. So I think that was, they had that very much in mind. Thank you. So um, very nice talk, David. Thank so you for quick you. question. So was there any interest in touching base with reality and observations or consequences as they were uh, moving along? Uh, interest, yes. I think they thought that conquering the two-body problem in GR was getting closer to that. 
I should say some of the early, there was an ongoing effort, as many of you might know, at Livermore in other approaches to numerical relativity, mostly for stellar astrophysics. They wanted to watch sort of single body collapse to supernova. And I think there was an even closer effort to connect early numerical relativity with astrophysics. This group, I think it was still mostly a formal problem to see could you even try to calculate these things before you even can compare them with there observations. There's no actual time where you see sort of this move towards sort of making a correspondence. Uh, I think that's in this later period here about which I know much less. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> um, so it's, it was a great pleasure to be here at this very interesting conference. So this will be uh, quite a different uh, type of talk, less philosophical and, and, and more technical. Um, and um, so what I'm going to be talking about is our conservation laws for fields on the curved space-time. And uh, so this is something I've been interested in for, for a while now. And uh, this is motivated uh, to a large extent by this stability problem uh, for the Kerr uh, black hole, so which was mentioned in some earlier talk. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, you know, this is something that needs to be established to make sure that the Kerr model can be relevant in astrophysics. And, um, and so from, the, from a certain point of view, there's been uh, a lot of progress on this, in particular uh, the work of Whiting 19, in 1989 sort of established a large part of this. But uh, for the full nonlinear uh, gravity problem, it's still open. And so here, uh, so here are just a couple of uh, recent results uh, relating to this. But the full, even for the linear stability problem of Kerr, it's still open. Um, another motivation uh, that so I'll mention a little bit later on uh, has to do with uh, uh, considering uh, perturbations and, and self-force. Uh, there's some recent work by Flanagan and Grant. And also, uh, I mean, in more general context, you can just ask yourself, what are the possible conservation laws that you can have? Um, and, and so this is the classification problem. Um, and uh, so let's think about what conservation laws you can have. Uh, so we, we know uh, Minkowski uh, space quite well. So here are the killing vectors, so just the isometries. There are 10-dimensional space of those. Conformal killing vectors, there is a 15-dimensional space of those. But there is more. Um, if you look at, at, uh, at what I'd like to call hidden symmetries, there's a 20-dimensional space of conformal killing Yano tensors. So those are tensors which satisfy twist equal to zero. And the twist is, uh, uh, this, is uh, this is a concept, this is related to Penrose's twisters. So Penrose, Penrose's twisters are, are an example of an object which, uh, which has twist zero. So these are valence two killing spinners, and Penrose's twisters are valence one killing spinners. And uh, having such objects around leads to uh, symmetries and conservation laws. Uh, so, so the classical idea is that just uh, symmetries of space-time leads to conservation laws, but you can, in fact, build conservation laws from such higher objects. Um, so if we think about uh, 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 Maxwell on Minkowski space, so this is very classical field theory, and it's the root of relativity, so to speak. And um, in the er, so late 1800s, early 1900s, <laughs> it was understood that the symmetry group is the conformal group and uh, the, ro the duality rotations. So this was discovered by Heaviside. Uh, later on, it was found that this, there are, in fact, more symmetries of Maxwell theory uh, so the, the, the group extends to this 23-dimensional uh, group. And this includes <coughs> symmetries which are not acting on space-time, but which are acting on the, on the fields and their derivatives, or on the jet space. And co correspondingly, uh, there are conserved currents. So the classical conserved currents are just the usual stress currents, 
momenta associated to, uh, to, to translations and rotations and boosts, but uh, associated to these non-geometric symmetries, there are uh, higher uh, conservation laws, and um, there is a large number of those. And so this is something that does not meet the eye when you think about me, uh, Maxwell theory um, uh, in, in a naive sense. And what I'm saying here uh, applies equally to, uh, to linearized gravity on Minkowski space. So that's a very similar theory to Maxwell theory. And uh, a couple of, ex so now if you have such symmetries, you can uh, apply another theory and get conservation laws. Uh, so uh, one example is the helicity. Um, so this is associated to these duality rotations that Heaviside discovered. Uh, another example is chirality, and so chirality is one of the conservation laws discovered by, Z by Lipkin in 1964, and uh, he called those zilches, so, and, uh, because he didn't see any immediate relevance of these, uh, these new conservation laws. But much more recently, both the helicity and, and this uh, current, co this conserved quantity called chirality have become interesting in optics. So this, uh, I just mentioned one paper here. So these authors are at the chemistry department here at Harvard and, and uh, the chirality uh, can be used to um, control uh, objects which, so mon molecules which are handed. This is the origin of the notion of chirality. So this is, for me, uh, this is somehow very surprising and so one asks if there are similar things going on uh, for gravity, <coughs> because gravity is very similar to Maxwell theory. So, uh, <coughs> and, and so the, the geometry of Kerr then is where we would like to understand uh, a little bit more. Uh, so Kerr is very special. <coughs> it's a it's algebra it has algebraically special curvature, uh, and this leads to uh, the existence of such a uh, twist zero killing, uh, conformal killing Yano tensor. Uh, and this is the origin of the, of the well-known Carter constant in, in, in for, for geodesics in the, in the curve space time. And uh, for fields, this leads to uh, separability, decoupling, and symmetry operators. <coughs> so uh, just a few words about uh, uh, black hole stability. Uh, so in, 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 the, in the case of uh, black hole stability, one of the major obstacles is the fact that you have trapped uh, or sort of orbiting photons. And uh, those are basically the obstacle to having the gravitational field. So the gravitational field also can track uh, these, these uh, null geodesics that, that where the photons orbit. Uh, and, and, and hang around for a long time. And this is an obstacle to dispersion, to having the, 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 the waves leave the system. Uh, and uh, so in order to overcome this, one has to exploit hidden symmetries related to the Carter constant. Um, and so here we have the field equations. So just think about the, the, these two, uh, so Maxwell and linearized gravity. And uh, they, as discovered in the 1970s, they lead to uh, decoupled and separable integrability conditions. So these are, uh, so well, so this is a fairly complicated equation. It's called the Tukolsky master equation. Uh, and uh, this, if you do separation of variables, this leads to a confluent Hoyne equation, so a, a hypergeometric equation. There are differential relations, which were also found by Tukolsky, um, which, well, look like that. Uh, but so this, this then, these facts, if you think about them from, a, from, a, from another pers perspective, can be seen to lead to new conservation laws. Uh, so here is, here is this, uh, you know, just a schematic view on this. So we have the, we start, we have the field equation. Uh, we apply more derivatives uh, and arrange uh, the resulting uh, expressions into an operator identity like this. So this, this is an idea that goes back to Wald, uh, 1978. 
And uh, so if we assume that the field equation is uh, self-adjoint, we assume that this, this, op this operator O represents the, the Tukolsky or the tukolsky starobinsky identity. Uh, assume that those are self-adjoint. Take the adjoint and just, just manipulate. That gives you immediately uh, a Debye map, so taking from uh, solutions of the Tukolsky equation to solution of the field equation, and it gives you a symmetry operator, taking solutions to solutions of the field equation. So once you have those tools, then you can construct symmetry operators, and there are in fact two ways, two ways of doing that, uh, essentially linear and, and antilinear. So one is rep relates to the tukolsky starobinsky identity, and is responsible for the separation of variables in the Tukolsky e equation. One produces a Debye map uh, that takes you from solutions of the Tukolsky to solutions of the field equation. Uh, and so this is now, uh, this has been explored in over the recent years, uh, and this is now quite well understood. And, and most recently, there's a new uh, symmetry operator uh, of this type that was found for lin linearized gravity on the curve space time. Uh, and this is a, an operator or order six. Uh, okay, so, um, so I think I'll skip this. Uh, so uh, this is just to point out that the structure for, the, for, the, for linearized gravity of this operator identity is, is quite different uh, uh, because of this lower order term that we saw al already in the in the in this uh, in the tukolsky starobinsky identities uh, in in the original paper, uh, and and so but in in any case, so this can be used to produce a, a, a new symmetry operator for linearized gravity. So now we have what we believe are the the new symmetry operators for linearized gravity on 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 the curve space time. So. Uh, we want to use that, those to construct uh, uh, new conser conservation laws. And the basic sort of canonical fact is uh, the symplectic current. And this is just uh, related to Green's identity like that. So whenever you have a, a field theory that's coming from an action principle, there is a symplectic current. And that can be, that can be used to construct uh, sort of Hamiltonian conservation laws. And in particular, the canonical energy is the one associated to the, the time translation. So, uh, so this is a quite a general setup, and we can use that in, in the examples that, that, I, that I mentioned. So uh, if we take one of the symmetry operators, insert it into the symplectic current, that's going to produce new uh, conservation laws. And so we do this uh, in, in the case of Maxwell theory, we get uh, currents that corresponds to the stress currents and to the zilches. Uh, and there is, a, there is a new current that is odd under duality rotations. Um, and uh, there is, in fact, also a conserved tensor uh, associated to this construction. So if we polarize the canonical energy, uh, this gives you uh, the, the the, en the energy current associated to this new uh, conserved uh, stress energy tensor. So this is a higher order stress energy tensor constructed out of the Maxwell field. Um, and so we can go on, uh, so we can play this game in many different ways. Uh, so here is, a, so from the two conserved, uh, two new symmetry operators for linear gravity, we can construct higher order conservation laws. And it's likely that these are the only sort of irreducible conservation laws that you have for, uh, for linear gravity beyond ones constructed from the killing fields. And, and so they're fairly high order in derivatives. Uh, and so an example of uh, sort of a, 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 an apl application of these, these ideas uh, this was studied by Gra Grant and Jana Flanagan uh, just recently. So they calculated in a sort of icono limit um, the, the, the conserved currents coming from the second type of symmetry operator, so the Debye map. 
and they found that this, cons this combination here gives something that behaves like uh, the Carter constant to the fourth power times the difference of the right and left handed uh, uh, waves. And uh, so for, uh, for linearized gravity, we again conjecture that the first type of symmetry operator that's associated to the, to the tikhovsky starobinsky identity uh, will produce uh, a similar uh, result here, but a third order in Carter. And uh, so finally, um, I'll just mention, uh, so another way you can play this game. So you can take, so the Debye map produces from solutions of the Tukolsky equation, solutions of the, of the linearized Einstein equation. So this is, a, this is in general a complex linearized metric that solves the vacuum uh, linearized Einstein equations. So this has a canonical energy, and you can view this as a conservation law, uh, as, a canon as a canonical energy for the Tukolsky master equation. So previously, there were, there were, it was believed that there were no such uh, canonical energies. And Prabhu and Wa Bob Wald uh, just recently calculated <coughs> and found that if you uh, insert this uh, and just project out one of the scalars that's contained in the, in the, in the linear gravitational field, in the field strength, uh, into this canonical energy, you get a complete square. And so you get a non-negative quantity, which happens to be identical to the Reggie Wheeler type energy used in that work by the firm of Solzhenitsyn and Rodiansky that I mentioned in the beginning. So this is uh, it's an, just one of the many ways you can play this game um, uh, to construct new uh, useful uh, conservation laws. Okay, so, so I, I'll just, I just want to end with this uh, quote, not from Chandrasekhar, but from Penrose. And so this is a, a, re a review or, or, or a, an article about Chandrasekhar and his work. And what he says here is that uh, so he talks about uh, some of the, the works of Carter, Walker, and Penrose, and so on. And he talks about the existence of a killing tensor, a killing spinner, a killing yellow tensor, things that I mentioned in this talk. And there are relations to twister theory, and this is the, the, the connection is the, the fact that the conformal killing is a twist zero object. Um, and it is my guess that the further study of Chandra's work in, from this direction may well throw pro some profound light on these issue, issues. So I think this, uh, and, and so what, what the things I mentioned in this talk are examples of such things that can still be got out. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. And first, congratulations to Avi and all the other um, organizers. This is a wonderful event to bring people together, as is this institute. So I would like to talk a little bit about a uh, special effect of gravitational waves. We have heard a lot about waves in this conference. And I'm a mathematician, so I, but, well, I hope to be more physical in this talk. So um, in our work, we prove usually theorems, but I would like to say, well, here is something where I, I think it's a beautiful topic where math and physics and um, observation comes together. So let me first um, give a short overview of certain space times we have studied and radiation. So we have typically isolated systems when we study clusters of stars, galaxies, etc. And another topic is, of course, the cosmological setting. So I will first give an overview what is actually a gravitational wave memory, and then it, um, explain a few things which are known in asymptotically flat systems, so when we study isolated systems and in a cosmological setting. Well, let me start with some pictures of Einstein. Well, of course, this is mostly about general relativity as well, and I personally like the one where uh, I found this, uh, this one for you on the left-hand side, where actually this is Einstein's graduation picture. Usually we see him at the more advanced age. 
And being a mathematician, so I couldn't resist show you this citation. So Einstein uh, wrote in a letter to Sommerfeld in November 1915, when he was really working on his GR paper. Let me cite, at present I occupy myself exclusively with the problem of gravitation and now believe that I shall master all difficulties with the help of a friendly mathematician, which was Marcel Grossman in Zurich. But one thing is certain, in all my life I have never labored nearly as hard and have become imbued with great respect for mathematics, the subtler part of which I had in my simple-mindedness regarded as pure luxury until now. Compared with this problem, the original relativity is child's play. So, I thought I had to show that. <laughs> um, before I go on and talk about the memory effect, this is a postcard also that Einstein wrote in 1923 to Hermann Weil, a mathematician in ETH Zurich, and at the time Einstein was actually in Berlin. Um, well, it's in German, and if you can decipher his handwriting on the um, right hand side from you, so he's talking about the cosmological constant. At the time it was not yet clear what the Sitter space, the cosmological de Sitter universe meant, and people were arguing about many things, but he basically says, well, if this comes down to a static universe, whatever that means for the moment, then away with the cosmological constant. So that's, um, if you can decipher it, it's written on the right hand side. Okay, but let's come back to the Einstein equations, and if you study an isolated system, so no cosmology, for instance, we would look at the Einstein equations as written here. On the um, left-hand side, we have geometry. On the right-hand side, we couple this to a stress-energy tensor where we feed in anything else we need, like electromagnetic waves or a fluid, etc. whatever um, we have to deal with. Um, if you are sitting in pure gravity, then the Einstein equations reduce to um, the equation which I call here number one, the vacuum equations when the right-hand side is actually zero. So then we have pure gravitation acting. Um, as I said, we will look at two different um, groups of space-times. First of all, um, asymptotically flat space-times, which really model uh, isolated systems, and in that sense, um, we can think of them as having a Minkowski flat metric at the background. And whenever we go far away from a source, so we will encounter things, our fields will decay to Minkowski space. Now equation two here has this lambda chi mu nu on the left hand side, so which is the cosmological term. And um, observations of the late 90s have shown that this, well, is a positive term and our universe is expanding at an accelerated rate. So one problem here already when we want to talk about radiation or there is no null infinity. I will explain to you what I mean by that, but when we travel along light cones, uh, light cones out to null infinity where we do observations um, of gravitational waves, so then um, in, a, in an asymptotically flat system there is all beautifully written down. We can um, derive radiation there, but it's not so clear what we should think, uh, what this should be at, uh, in a cosmological space time, because this null infinity is space-like. So we cannot read off radiation there. There's no natural way to do that. So maybe a short picture. So when I talk about the foliation of a space time, I typically have in mind, of course, I go with time, and then I have a space-like slice um, that I can uh, look at, and then also I will follow gravitational waves or light, so which typically, typically travel along light cones in GR, and so this will be a foliation accord into this kind of light cones. And I will be interested in going out to null infinity along these light cones. So here's a definition in a mathematical language. So what, when I talk about future null infinity, this is basically the end of these light cones where we are sitting and doing experiments. So this is basically um, defined as the endpoint of all future directed um, null geodesics along which R, the parameter R is blowing up and it has the topology of R cross S2. And my function U um, is now parameterizing my null infinity. Okay, so I will talk about these null hypersurfaces, which are really generalized light cones. Um, well, talking about gravitational waves, we, you know, we have, of course, the experts in, that, in this audience, but also one way to think about it, for me, in the picture of the light cone is here on the right-hand side, whereas the source itself, like the boundary uh, of two, uh, the merger of two black holes, is traveling along a time-like um, path. Of course, the radiation goes out along null, light cones and will reach null infinity or close to null infinity at some point. So I'd like to read off something from there. 
But what is now the memory effect? So when we think of um, what LIGO has already detected, for instance, so we have the gravitational wave packet that comes from the source, travels through the detector, which is, well, one portion of the space-time, and then the detector, the, the, the display, um, the test masses are moving. And what the memory effect now is, says, well, after the packet has actually passed, there will be a permanent change in the space-time, like a footprint in the universe. And we can measure that by um, this permanent displacement of the test masses. So um, let me say maybe a few words how this all started. So the, for the first time, looking at linearized gravity, that was Seldovich and Polnareff in 74, who showed that, well, there is a tiny effect um, that they called memory. So there's a small effect that was known um, since then. Then um, also in the full nonlinear GR, Christodoulou showed, Dimitri Christodoulou, that there is a nonlinear effect which is much bigger than this linear one found by Seldovich and Polnareff. And interesting enough, so Christodoulou derived this from a very, so there was um, a big work with, that he did with Kleinemann on the stability, nonlinear stability of Minkowski space, and it's a very mathematical work, but basically they derived at the very end the full description of null infinity, which um, he could use to derive this memory effect. Um, many, many people have worked on that, and I apologize if I cannot really um, cite if I forget someone, but something in the later in recent years, which we found um, was interesting when I looked with um, STL and Poning Cheng at what happens when we add Maxwell equations to the Einstein equations. So how does the memory change? So we found that the memory effect is enlarged by the Maxwell fields, and also that neutrino radiation would enlarge this memory. And, but interesting enough, so people always thought this is a linear and a nonlinear effect of one thing called memory, but then actually with David Garfinkel, we showed that these are two different kinds. So this two, these are two different memories with, which have two different sources, whereas the, the, the thing that people call linear has to do with one portion of the wild tensor changing over time and will be tiny and maybe hard to detect. So the other one that is now called the Christodoulou effect is the non, well, used to be called nonlinear, has to do really with fields that travel out to null infinity. If you are in pure gravity, so this has to do with the shears of the light cones, or better known also as the news tensor. And funny enough, so um, with Garfinkel, we thought, well, is GR really the only place that um, exhibits such a memory effect? And we started looking at just the pure um, linear Maxwell equations, and we found these two types of memory analogs in the Maxwell equations, which would um, result in a kick or a residual velocity of charge test particles. So in the meantime, um, um, Andy Strominger and other people have also explored many other fields and analogies to, to memory. So back to gravitational waves. So when we do a gravitational wave experiment, we want to measure what, how the, the test masses actually move, and we measure this by, if you are here on Earth, for instance, by the Jacobi equation, so the geodesic equation. Well, on the left-hand side, if I want to have some acceleration of the test part of how test particles move apart, which is given on the right-hand side by the curvature of my space-time, and of course. There's a lot encoded on the right hand side. It's a very simple, nice looking equation, but um, we need to understand how these space times with radiation actually behave and how to read off the asymptotics and the curvature on the right hand side. Now, um, to make things simple, we can derive um, a permanent displacement. So looking at this e equation using the null asymptotics, um, and there are various ways to do that. So we can now derive that there will be a permanent displacement um, which is given by a formula that encodes these two different memories. So one will be this ordinary memory that I said, which um, goes back and people call linear, so which is sourced by really a specific part, namely the, the RR part of the electric part of the wild tensor, and that's a tiny effect. And the other, the null memory, going back to Christodoulou, is really sh um, sourced by the shear in pure gravity and anything else that has a good decay behavior along null infinity. So any other um, uh, field you plug into the energy momentum tensor that goes like 1 over r squared, basically. Um, so Christodoulou used a very mathematical um, method to de um, derive his effect, and so we did 
follow this path at some point, but we also thought that we need some other approximation methods when we cannot do the full mathematical machinery, so we came up with a simplified method to do that. So for us, interesting will be that um, Lasky, Thrain, Levin, Blackman, and Chen last year suggested in a paper by LIGO that um, maybe um, by stacking several events of binary black hole mergers with memory, LIGO might even be able to detect that. So I hope that uh, that's not too far in the future. Let me um, say, well, I talked about isolated systems and null infinity, but now we have cosmological space times um, where I said we don't have null infinity and well, there's a problem when we want to um, read off radiation. And well, let me say three things. So I want to talk about the Lambda CDM cosmology. That's a, a work we have just finished. But we have also, of course, the Dusseter space time, which models the inflation period of the universe, and the Friedman Lumet or Robertson Walker with the perfect fluids, that, um, if you think of the homo homogeneity. But nowadays, we are away from a perturbation of FLRW, so we have to deal the, uh, with the Lambda CDM model. So maybe first the Zusita metric, that's the simplest to look at. Well, here, because it's conformal to Minkowski space, um, this is something very straightforward still to look at. So you can actually show that, well, if you are in a Zusita space, the memory effect is not too much affected by it, except for it has a redshift factor. So in the Zusita space time, we find that there is a factor of one plus RH zero, which is multiplied um, by the energy uh, the energy multiplied by the factor um, and the memory effect we can derive from this energy is actually enhanced by this um, factor. Um, if you look at FLRW, so first of all, if you do a small perturbation of FLRW, that's not exactly our space time we live, on, live in. We have now bigger inhomogeneities in the background, so we have to take care of that as well. But let me say two words about FLRW and lambda CDM. Um, First, if you look at FLRW, there was a paper by Tolish and Walt where they also say, look um, at some FLRW background, and also similar to the Dissiter case, you find that there is an enhancement by some redshift factor um, when you compare it to Minkowski space. So um, a paper we just um, finished with um, David Garfinkel and Nico Yunus. So we looked now at the inhomogeneous inhomogeneity in the Lambda CDM model, and we thought, well, maybe gravitational lensing will actually have an effect as well. So, um, and here the problem um, that we don't have null infinity, we overcame by actually looking at two different zones. So one is the wave zone and um, a cosmological zone, whereas in one zone things look very close to Minkowski space, and we can say, well, if we are not too far, uh, if the source is not too redshifted, then um, assuming that we have Minkowski in the background is a pretty good approximation. But in the cosmological zone, the memory, when we have really um, redshifted um, objects, the memory will be enlarged by not only the redshift, but also um, gravitational lensing magnifies this effect. Um, this is going to come out soon. So interesting for us is that um, we do have gravitational lensing interfering that, and when we are looking for um, sources with memory which are at high redshift, so we should take into account that this lensing actually interferes with it. So let me stop here. That was a very nice talk. Um, Thank you. So you, you mentioned the lensing. Are you talking yep. about lensing of small scales? Weak, weak lensing. Weak lensing. So weak lensing, but yep. of perturbations, you're thinking... The per you know, yeah. Ga so, like galaxies. Right, that sort of. right, right. But then what's, what sets the scale? I mean, so the, the galaxies have a scale. Right. So then is it related to the... I mean, what, what sets then the scale on the radiation side? Is it the wavelength of the... So it's the wavelength. So we use a short uh, wavelength approximation actually to do that. And it's really um, the wavelength that, that scales everything. And so so yeah. the wavelength of the gravitational waves. Yes. So you'll have different right. effects. So it'll right. be a sort of chromatic effect. Right. Yeah. Um, so a simple-minded astrophysicist would think about the memory effect uh, in a sense of um, energy being lost. So in other words, if you surround right. the source with a sphere, right. uh, having the radius of our distance from the source, energy is being lost and therefore 
As a result, uh, if you think about the Schwarzschild solution, the, the mass interior is smaller by some mm -hmm. amount, and there is a permanent change to the metric due mm -hmm. to the loss of energy from that sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, if it, there is lensing, that could affect uh, how much energy is going right. uh, in, in different directions. Uh, is that, uh, what is that astrophysicist missing, thinking about it this way? Is there something else to the memory effect? Uh, than what I have just said. Th then uh, this simple interpretation of mass being lost, because that would be common to electromagnetic, it would become, even if the mass goes in neutrinos, it's the same thing. You, you just change the amount of mass enclosed within that sphere. Right, it's energy loss. So um, right. there's two things, right? So let me maybe comment on this, what people call the linear, which is the ordinary memory. So this is really, um, here you just change the one portion of the wild curvature, but everything else is null memory. I can, I don't have time to go into details, but basically what you think about it, this is really the energy lost um, uh, over a sphere, exactly. So this is really the energy which is lost. And here, as we know, we can put in mass or any other Maxwell field, if you like. No, 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 not the map. Because that doesn't affect the curvature tensor at infinity of this order. That falls off as 1 over r cubed. So this memory effect falls off as 1 over r in the Riemann tensor. So energy in the, so in a, the broad... Really, it is really not just the change in mass from beginning to end. It's a, it's a different... It well, for example, two stars that go like this, the gravitational Bremsstrom, and just deflect each other, there's a memory effect just from that. So there's so one you can, yes, that, your linear that one is the linear one. So this linear momentum, which is conserved, this also gives you, this is the linear one. On the, on the other one, right, the non, what people call nonlinear, this is an energy uh, I can write down basically, which is lost, but it's, it goes back to the, to the shear of, of the light cones in the end. This is not achromatic. This is chromatic, right? The mm -hmm. lensing will depend on the wavelength. Right. That's the, from your normal gravitational lensing, this is sort of the key observational difference. Well, it's um, uh, weak lensing in general, right? So when you look at the inhomogeneities, and so what um, we use uh, uh, um, some result by uh, Younes Laguna and uh, Spurgel and other people on the sachs wolf effect. Mm -hmm. So, and basically something similar um, can be used in our paper um, to derive what we, how lensing comes into the game. Okay, uh, so thanks for the, the uh, organizers, Eric, for inviting me here. Having a really good time. I'm a theorist. I don't see a lot of experimental talks, so I really enjoyed yesterday and also the talks this morning. Um, before I forget, I should mention this is work in collaboration with uh, uh, Kareem Tabolt, who's a philosopher. Uh, I am a physicist, so probably my talk is going to be a bit more physics heavy uh, than he would have given, but in any case, uh, uh, just a, a warning. Um, so, uh, so basically what I want to tell you about, oh, uh, let me just motivate what I want to do. So uh, my takeaway message from yesterday was basically that general relativity black holes probably exist. Um, and if they exist, and we believe more or less that general relativity is true, uh, then you might also have to believe that singularities are ubiquitous. And I know that uh, Eric might say there's a theorem that uh, there's no Borel measure on the space because it's infinite dimensional. Uh, but um, I'm like this statement, like most of the statements in my talk, it's going to be just uh, more hand wavy than uh, really rigorous. If you want more detail, just ask later. But for the sake of time and pedagogy, I'm just going to kind of skip a lot of the details. Um, but anyway, uh, the point is that you really want to start believing that there you know, general relativity predicts that there will be singularities. And then the question is, are these singularities useful things in the theory? Uh, you know, do we, should we live with, learn to live with them, or um, is, is there a way to kind of get rid of them? And so, uh, one hope is that uh, quantum effects could either ease the singularity, make it maybe less of a, less singular, or, or remove them completely. Um, and so, uh, you know, the one reason why you might expect that is just a very simple argument from the uncertainty principle that, um, you know, if the singularity is at a point, 
you can never actually be at a point because that would mean that your dispersion momentum would have to be infinite. So there's a kind of very simple general argument that m you may expect that these singularities could get smoothed out. Um, but one slightly disappointing thing is that if you just take very simple uh, naive quantization where you just take the Hamiltonian of GR and you put hats on it, even for very simple models that have cosmological singularities, um, this quantization doesn't resolve the singularity. Um, and I could give you more detail about why that's the case, but that's a fairly well-known thing. And so you might think, well, maybe we should introduce something like string theory or loop quantum gravity. Maybe this quantization is just too simple. But that doesn't change the fact that there's a simple uh, argument about the uncertainty principle that um, you seems to be breaking down. So um, basically, uh, we asked ourselves the question, what's going wrong with this quantization? And what we believe is that it has to do with the way time is treated in this Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which is timeless. And I'll get into, into that in a bit. So that's my uh, motivation. Um, now I'll just very quickly tell you uh, w what I'm going to do, which is that uh, I'm going to just quantize, give you a quantization of a very simple cosmological model. Um, and uh, instead of having a timeless formalism, we're going to uh, give uh, an equation that has genuine evolution. And uh, it turns out this fixes the problem, okay? Uh, so, uh, now this might be something you, m maybe you don't like the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, maybe you never heard of the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, you don't really care. But when we did this, we realized that there, this, this quantization actually has a lot of other features that uh, are also interesting. And it's just a model, but, but still it has some interesting features which include, uh, uh, oh, so, the, there's only a, a well-defined semi-classical limit if lambda's positive, and that's kind of good. Um, there's also an inflate, something that looks like a, an inflationary epoch due to the kind of um, effective dynamics of the, of the quantum geometry. Um, I, I wouldn't take this seriously yet as an actual inflation, but it's just it, it's an inflationary epoch. Uh, and um, there's a macroscopic parameter that encodes sort of the physics of the deep quantum regime. So it's something that we might be able to, in principle, measure uh, at late times that could just encode something about the deep quantum physics. And also, it's, um, there are condensed matter systems that are mathematically analogous to this particular uh, quantization. So uh, you could think of this these systems as quantum simulators of the universe, if you believe in this model. Okay. So anyway, that's where I'm going, uh, and I don't have much time, but I'll try to, uh, oh, for the purposes of this conference, there are arguments that this simple model could actually be uh, applied more generally. So I'll get back to that at the end, hopefully. Um, but keep in mind in your head, this simple model is simple, but uh, uh, the basic principles can be applied more generally. I have 10 minutes, that was 10 minutes? Oh. Okay. Uh, so that's okay because that was the most important part of my talk anyway, the rest is just details. Um, so I'm just gonna look at homogeneous isotropic mini superspace model with uh, vanishing spatial curvature. Um, this is the Hamiltonian. Basically, the only thing about this model is there's a scale factor and a scalar field. So you just have, you pick some region uh, and then the volume of that region changes in time. There's a scalar field inside and the density can also change. So those are the variables. Um, this is the Hamiltonian, I show it for completeness, but really uh, a nice change of coordinates can allow you to write it in this kind of nice geometric way, where G is just the inverse of the Minkowski metric on, on configuration space, not the space-time metric, the metric on configuration space. So this is, this is like a, a, a flat, on configuration space, it just looks like a flat um, theory of GUD6. And the solutions are literally just the GUD6 on this configuration space, so they're straight lines. But A is positive, the scale factor is positive, and that gives you a kind of geometric restriction. You're not on the full Minkowski plane, you're on the Rindler wedge, okay? And, uh, and so, but the Rindler is not geodesically complete. So your classical solutions run off the space-time, and that's basically how you understand why this, uh, why this model is um, singular, 
Okay, um, and you can prove that there are curvature singularities that happen uh, when you run off the, 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 when you basically run into the horizon. So the Rindler horizon in this is interpreted as the, the Big Bang, okay? Um, and this fact that the, 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 there is a horizon also leads to the complications and interesting features of the quantum model, okay? So, um, so here I just put the classical solutions. Um, the equations are not that important. Basically, uh, this is V volume, so it's A cubed, uh, as a function of some re, some scalar, the scalar field itself. And so this is like where we are now, almost a, like a de Sitter kind of expansion. Um, and then as you go back in time, you get closer to V equals zero, where the scalar, for, scalar field goes to infinity, okay? So the Big Bang is kind of on this line. And, um, and there's some parameters, but they can, they can be, you can get rid of them by time translational invariance, boost invariance on the, on the Minkowski plane, and then, um, then all you have left are, is the total energy, energy should be in brackets, it's the cosmological constant, and then the, the momentum of the scalar field, which is a conserved quantity. So these are the two parameters of the theory, but they can just be rescaled by rescaling the time and space units. So these are all the classical solutions, and all the different classical solutions, except for lambda equals zero, okay, which is degenerate, but, but for positive lambda, um, these are all the solutions, and they just go through at different rates, but that's not really physically meaningful, right? So, um, okay, so that's the classical theory. Now, when we want to quantize the, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, so the kind of naive, conventional way of quantizing, uh, I mean, this is the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, so the quantization just puts like hats on these things. Um, is to come up with an equation like this. Our proposal is literally just to take this thing and put a time derivative here. And the time is not meant to be some observable thing. The time is just this tau, you don't measure. It's just something that um, parameterizes your observables. So you basically have two observable operators. Um, oh, maybe I'll do that on the next slide. Well, I'll say it now. We have two observable operators, v and phi, and they um, change as a function of tau, but you don't measure tau, you just measure how the two operators are changing with respect to each other. And that's sort of the main difference between what we are trying to do and this Wheeler-DeWitt approach. And um, so intuitively what happens is that um, because we have these two operators, uh, they, we have an uncertainty principle. So um, in the Wheeler-DeWitt approach, you have to use an internal clock to recover time. There's no time fundamentally in the equation, so you have to kind of use a clock internal to the system. The problem is that clock has definite values. So you used to say, what is the value of some observable, some operator, when phi is two or three? But then all classical values are allowed, and so when phi goes to infinity, this thing is not well defined. So that's the intuitive argument why the conventional quantization breaks down and why ours works, okay? Um, but again, I could go into a lot more detail to show this more rigorously, but this is just the intuition. Um, so the, the tricky thing that gives us all the interesting features is unitarity. If I take our Hamiltonian operator, which is actually just a Klein-Gordon operator, okay, it's a box operator on the space. But now we're in Rindler, we're on the Rindler wedge, we're not on the whole Minkowski plane, so um, there's a boundary term. And if we want unitarity, the boundary term has to vanish. So, uh, so then there's a whole formalism for constructing solutions uh, of this boundary term equal to zero. And I just want to give you the kind of intuitive argument about how you get these, because the boundary equals zero happens to be conformally invariant equation. And so what you can do is you can go to the conformal completion. So you can just do a conformal transformation that maps Rindler to Minkowski. Then you can solve box operator in Minkowski, which is very easy, it's just plane waves. And then this, the, uh, on the boundary, um, it's the same equation. So you can just, is that, does that mean my time is up? Oh, five minutes, okay. So on the boundary, it's the same equation. So you can basically just anchor the solutions um, that you want to this boundary term vanishing by using the conformal completion of the configuration space. 
So it's just a little trick. Um, and uh, again, uh, so I thought it would be better that going into the details, I just kind of give you this intuitive geometric argument. But, um, okay. But the thing is, is that um, the boundary term is conformally invariant, but the rest of the solution isn't. So you construct your solutions. If you want to continue them into the bulk, you have to um, introduce a parameter, um, and a parameter that has a dimension. And that thing, it turns out, that um, dimensionful quantity is going to be um, effectively telling you the size of the quantum effects in the theory. So when I started with the classical plots, I said there was no real scale here. This new parameter, which is basically breaking um, scale invariance, is giving meaning to the size of the quantum effects. It's giving you more um, non-trivial solutions. Um, but anyway, um, OK. So these are fairly technical details. Uh, I just want to describe there are states so I want to describe the, basically the spectrum of this operator once you kind of go through this machinery. Um, there are states where lambda is less than zero. So these are like anti de sitter like states. And they're bound. They're kind of bound to the horizon. Uh, they decay exponentially with the volume. So they're just sort of stuck to the Big Bang. It's kind of weird. So we don't regard these as states that have an a, a interpretation in terms of a semi-classical limit. Um, there are some other features. The, the eigen, it's a discrete spectrum, but it's not bounded from below. So there's this tower of um, states, and there's an infinite number of them. And you might think that's a really weird thing, except that uh, there's a analog systems that uh, you can build in the lab that actually have this property. And, and really what happens is that there's a cutoff at some point. Um, that, that this is just an uh, effective description, and then there's a cutoff, and then um, the spectrum gets cut off for that reason. So anyway, maybe I shouldn't go into too, too much detail because th these are the states that I find more interesting, the ones where lambda is greater than zero, because these ones go like Bessel, Bessel, uh, Bessel functions. And the Bessel functions go far away from the, the, the uh, survive to large V, which means that they survive to late times. Um, and so, uh, and so, but you have to do this kind of phase shift between the, the two linearly independent solutions. And that phase is basically giving you interference that's getting rid of the, uh, that's solving the boundary condition, okay? So that's what this phase is doing. It has this form, um, but that's not that important. What you guys, what, well, I mean, it is important, but, um, <laughs> but if you're, Following the technical details, that's good. If you're not, um, I want to show you what they look like. So the next thing is going to be a video of the um, actual um, probability distribution of the wave function as it comes in and out. So just to show you what it looks like. This should be more interesting. So, um, so V is going in this direction, and phi is going in this direction. And if you remember the, um, the classical solution, So if you remember, and I'll show that picture again, but um, not, no, oh, okay, there we go. So it comes in, it wants to go out here to the, what the classical solution is doing, going out to the, the bounds, but it stops, shifts back, and then comes back out. So you have a bounce solution, not a bang, and everything is finite. All expectation values are finite. And if you don't believe me, well, ask me about the details, but here are the plots. So the Expectation value of the volume comes in, in the classical theory goes to zero, but in the quantum theory it stops, it has this minimum, and then it comes back out the same way. Um, and same thing with phi. In the classical theory, the phi wants to go out to infinity, but in the quantum theory it reaches some kind of uh, minimum value and then turns back around, okay? Um, so, um, I, I'm just about out of time, but, oh, okay, I am out of time. Uh, these are what the classical solutions looked like, remember? Um, if you plot the expectation values on the same thing, and what I show you was just the probability distribution over this, um, over this configuration space. So the movie was just 
the wave function moving along here. Um, you have basically three different regimes, uh, depending on the size of this reference thing, which is this basically the size of the quantum effect. So you can have a regime where the solutions look to sitter just about the whole time. You have another regime where you stay to the classical solutions until the, you get really, really close to the, bi the, the, the Big Bang, and then you turn around, and you kind of sharply go here. But there's a, a third regime, which I think is interesting, where um, you kind of start moving away from the classical solutions, and then you stay at constant phi for quite a long time, and that's inflation, right? Where d phi by dv is effectively zero. So there's something that looks like an inflationary period, but I don't really know the parameter space how to compare that. I haven't done that work yet. This is fairly new results. Um, this is the actual calculation of the plots for, for this one. So this is what it looks like. This, the other one was the cartoon. Okay, so just to, oh no, I'm not gonna talk about this. Um, just to summarize, um, it's amazing that all we really did was just treat time in a different way, but we were able to uh, resolve the singularity that existed in the timeless approach. Um, we get a uh, semi-classical limit, which is to sitter, so we're really quantizing uh, the symmetry-reduced version of GR here. Um, but there's some interesting phenomenology. If you're, the, the picture gets really, has lots of interesting features in the, in the quantum regime, and that um, is, should lead to some um, phenomenology. Um, there's this macro parameter, which is this reference scale, which is encoded in the microphysics. I didn't talk about this very much, but basically it's a phase difference. If you think about this model as a scattering experiment off of the, 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 off of the Big Bang, you send in like a Gaussian state, which is peaked on the classical solution, you scatter it off of the, the Big Bang and it comes back out, then this is the phase difference. And that depends on basically how the, the microphysics is, is being cut off, okay? So anyway, um, uh, there are analog systems that do this and you can build systems that have the same kind of um, Lagrangian in the lab. And so that's philosophically, the, or even more so, it'd be interesting to think of these systems as simulators of the, of the early universe. So I'm gonna stop there, okay? <clears throat> yeah, this is very interesting, but you focused just on the Big Bang singularity. Uh -huh. Does this have any implications for black hole singularities? Good question, good question, and, and um, that's why I had, I actually did want to talk about this, but I ran out of time, so thank you for um, asking the question. Um, if you, it's, it's just a very quick, like, two-step argument. If there's, um, we can do Bianchi 1, really simple. It's the same theory, just with a, with a different value of, of, different meaning for the K. But then Bianchi 9 is uh, qualitatively the same, the, the solu it's just a different potential. So you have um, basically different, uh, instead of having the Bessel functions, you have functions that have the same pro asymptotic properties as the Bessel functions, but a different interpolation between them. So I think it can do that too, it's just I have to do it numerically. The point is, that if you believe in the BKL, or at least to the extent to which the BKL conjecture is true, which is just saying that uh, near singularities, GR near singularities is uh, uh, um, quasi-low, uh, no, uh, is ultra-local, so that you basically have decoupled Bianchi nines everywhere, then uh, you could apply the same mathematics to the general BKL problem, and you can have a description of uh, GR near uh, uh, kind of any kind of singularity. So that's still a kind of long way away, but, but there is a, a route to get there, and that's why I think it's kind of relevant. Uh, I'm curious about this macro parameter. Um, is so, the, is the scale set by the spectra of um, of the operators? And in any event, um, how, how can you like describe an, a kind of experiment we could do to measure this this reference scale? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the first question, um, 
is, uh, okay, where, where is it coming from? Really, it's a parameter. It's coming from um, the parameter that's, uh, par your Hamiltonian is not essentially self-adjoint. So you need to introduce a self-adjoint extension parameter. And, but that thing is U1. And um, basically, uh, I don't know how the formula, but anyway, you need to introduce this reference scale to give meaning to that self-adjoint extension parameter. And it winds up being equivalent to a, a conformal anomaly. But the, I mean, the, uh, when, when you have, an, when you, um, have to do these self-adjoint extensions, they're never unique. Is there a way to pick out a unique one? No, but that's, that's the, no, there isn't, right? So that's the point is that this, they're not unique, and so you have a family of them. Choosing a reference scale picks a self-adjoint extension, okay? So the idea is, at least in the analog models, if you, if you want to think about what's happening in terms of what's happening in the analog models, the self-adjoint extension is chosen by the way that the uh, uh, microphysics is completing, the, uh, um, the, the way that the macrophysics is being cut off by the fundamental macrophysics of the theory. So if you might think, well, really, this is just too simple of a model. Really, maybe there's some string theory happening or some loop quantum or whatever. Uh, that physics is encoded in the self-adjoint extension parameter in the analog models. So you might think that here, that's the natural interpretation for it. Okay, I don't know if that helps. So one of the principles that you try to satisfy is unitarity. Uh, wow. And in the case of the Big Bang, it's possible to imagine a bounce as you uh, infer where time reversal is, is possible. But uh, when making, let's say, a singularity in a black hole, uh, it's a, a, an irreversible process by which, I, I mean, if you have unitarity, how would you imagine um, reversing time, and, and would it be a white hole, or what would happen uh -huh. after the bounce, if, if it looks anything like the bounce that you describe in cosmology? Oh, uh, like a bounce in a black hole. The, uh, what, what would be the, the future of that? I haven't thought much about the, what would happen if it was a black hole. So, uh, I, 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 I I don't want to come out, try to think on the top of my head to come up with a stupid answer. Uh, okay. But, um, but do you think unitarity But the idea would, would be, be if you, so it might not be possible to, to have a, a unitary evolution of the wave function, right? right. In this case, it, I, you know, you had to, I had to dig up this old literature or mathematical physics literature, which I didn't understand, and I spent weeks trying to figure out how to do this. Uh, but it, it might just not be possible to do in the more general case. And then, then you might have to think, so if you don't have a unitary Hamiltonian, then you might have to, you might think that that is what quantum singularity is, right? It's just in probability leaking out of your universe or something uh, because of the, the, this kind of um, pathological part of your configuration space. Um, so it's good to have a unitary, in this case I, I is able to do it. I suspect one can do it with the black hole too, but uh, I, I don't want to speculate too much about that. Sorry. <laughs> we could talk more later. I would love to talk more about it. Not knowing the answer is, is a fine uh, situation. Yeah, yeah. But I'm on record now, right? So if I say something that's wrong. Yeah. Uh, there is no need. <laughs> Am I right in thinking that the introduction of time into the Wheeler-DeWitt equation in this way is picking out a foliation explicitly. The what time? The, the introduction of, 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 of time into the Wheeler-DeWitt ah. equation in this way. Do you want to say just a bit about why that's okay in this framework? Uh, okay, so that's a good point. So in, because we're in the cosmological context, the, there is a natural foliation, which is just the one that, where things look homogeneous. Um, in regards to making this uh, you know, full theory of quantum cosmology where you would want to be able to go to different foliations. Um, that's an interesting problem which I've thought a lot about. Um, but uh, but ba basically the idea is that um, this time is, uh, in the more general case, you could think of it as the four volume. But that thing is diffeomorphism invariant. So. Uh, even though uh, th this quantization is very similar to like quantum unimodular gravity, uh, and, and the, 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 the global time is the, basically the, technically the same thing. And so Kuka, uh, unimodular gra gravity died for the, the, the reason you just 
said that, that Kukash suspected that it was not diffeomorphism invariant. But I disagree with Kukash for technical reasons, and we should talk about it after.